friends, welcome back to Food Prep Guide. Today's video is all about some common mistakes that are really easy to make in food preservation. These are mistakes that I have made. Um, these are mistakes that I know are pretty common based on questions and emails that we have received and things that I see on social media groups like, why did my potatoes turn gray? Or why did my dehydrated food go soft on the shelf? Um, it's just little things that are easy to make as a beginner, but even as, a, as a, an experienced canner or dehydrator or freezer, um, just someone who's into food preservation, you know, sometimes we're just working quickly trying to get things done and things slip our mind. I am guilty of that big time. Um, so I wanted to go over five of the, uh, what I believe to be to some of the most common um, mistakes that are made during food preservation and what we can do to make sure that we don't make the mis those mistakes so that we can produce as high quality of a product as possible. So let's jump right into it. By the way, if you would like help building your food storage, scroll down to the description box of this video and click this link for our free one year food storage plan. We calculated a year supply of food for one person, then broke that data down into a week by week list of items to build your pantry on a budget. We'll send it straight to your inbox. If you're new here, we invite you to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss all of our upcoming food preservation, pantry storage, and gardening tutorials. Now back to the kitchen. Mistake number one is going to be testing your dried foods too early testing them for doneness too early. So I have a jar of uh, mixed vegetables here. This is one of my favorite ways to put up um, vegetables, especially early on before I had a really productive garden. I would just go to my freezer section, mixed vegetables when they were on sale. They used to go on sale for 99 cents a bag. I don't know if they do that anymore, um, but that's when I would buy them and stock up on them and freeze them. Um, and there was a period of time where I was running my dehydrator night and day doing these mixed vegetables, getting as many on the shelf as I could because they were so easy to throw into things like soups and um, fried rice really easily, uh, casseroles, just a very quick and easy food that I knew I would use in my food storage. I knew it wouldn't sit there forever and ever um, and go bad. So I ran into this mistake and learn this mistake through trial and error. And now I know that when you are testing your food for doneness out of the dehydrator, you need to wait until it comes to room temperature. Um, so when we test foods for doneness, it's gonna be different depending on what you are drying. So for instance, uh, fruits have a tendency because they are high in sugar to remain pliable. But for the most part, what we're looking for is to break it and hear that crunch. Let me do one more. I don't think I had that close enough to my microphone. But break it and hear that crunch is what we want. And we want to be able to squeeze it and it will either powder in our hands depending on what the type of food is or these like green beans, they will just remain hard and there's no stickiness to them. There's no moisture droplets when we squeeze them. And that's how we test for doneness. But the problem is when I first started uh, dehydrating, I would turn or I would keep my dehydrator on and just slide the trays out and test for doneness right there in front of the dehydrator and that's a big no-no because what happens is it gets pretty warm in that dehydrator. Um, we're normally drying at around 120, 125 degrees Fahrenheit somewhere in that ballpark which is pretty warm and food in a warm state like that can feel soft even when it's completely done. So I now know that what I need to do is pull a tray out. I don't turn the dehydrator off just yet because I don't know if it's done. And I want all that other food um, to be continuing to dry in the process while I'm doing the testing. So I do leave my dehydrator on, but I pull a whole tray out and I set it, I do my drying in the laundry room. So I set mine on top of the dryer and I let it come to room temperature completely before testing. It usually takes about 20 minutes. Um, to do that. That's just kind of a ballpark estimate. Um, but just wait until the food is at completely room temperature and then do all the testing that you need to do, whether you're breaking apart, listening for that crunch, looking for water droplets. If it's a, a, fr a fruit, um, it's okay for it to be a little bit pliable. It's okay for it to not snap, but we want to rip it open and squeeze the sides and look at the cut side for any droplets of moisture coming out. So, I hope that um, kind of helps you test your dried foods better. If you have been drying something and it seems like it is just not getting done, maybe it's because you were testing it while it was still in its warm state. So let your food come to room temperature before testing your dehydrated goods. I need to put this aside and not forget to re-vacuum seal this because it was vacuum sealed. 
and I need to get that re-vacuum sealed. Okay, number two, common mistake, and this is a hot take, y'all. This is, this is going to be controversial, I know, um, because I've seen it spark some controversy on social media, um, but that is believing that all tomato products can be water bath canned. And I can tell you where this thought process comes from, and it is from seasoned preservers who have taught us, our grandmothers, our great-grandmothers, and just knowledge and wisdom that has been passed down through the generations because in generations past, tomatoes were far more acidic than they are today because of soil depletion, mineral depletion, farmland being stripped of nutrients and all that, um, tomato breeding, all the hybrid, hybrid uh, breeding that we have going on. It just over time, our tomatoes are not as acidic as they used to be. I think that's probably one reason why a lot of the grocery store tomatoes are just, they're kind of flavorless. I mean, if you've never had a garden fresh tomato, you are totally missing out. It is a night and day difference between what, you're, between what you can produce in your garden and what you get at the grocery store. But anyway, I think a lot of that has to do with the loss of acidity. So we used to be able to water bath can all tomato products and not even have to think about it. But today, we really have to be careful about whether we water bath canned tomatoes or pressure canned tomatoes. So I have three examples here just to show you real quick. This is a salsa. This is a barbecue sauce. I'm not going to try to balance that because I will drop it and lose some precious food preservation. Anyway, and this is a spaghetti sauce. So barbecue sauce, salsa, and a spaghetti sauce. Two of them are water bath canned. One is pressure canned. Can you guess which one's which and why? So the one that has to be pressure canned is this spaghetti sauce. Doesn't have any meat in it, by the way. No meat. If it had meat in it, obviously it would have to be pressure canned, but this is a meatless spaghetti sauce. So why does this have to be pressure canned and this barbecue sauce and this salsa doesn't? This can be, these two can be water bath canned. It comes down to acidity. It comes down to what kind of acidifiers do you have in your recipe and what kind of low acid ingredients have you added to it? So for salsa, even though we are adding onions and peppers, jalapenos, you know, garlic, things that are low acid, even though that's being added to our salsa, salsa recipes that are safe for water bath canning are acidified with something beyond just tomatoes. We're not depending on our tomatoes to acidify our products. That is no longer a safe practice in canning. It used to be, it's not anymore. And that's kind of why I'm wanting to discuss this today. Um, but salsas, they have some kind of acidifier in it, right? Like, and, and a pretty good chunk of it, whether it be lemon juice, lime juice, vinegar, apple cider vinegar. Um, it has a decent heavy amount of an acidifier in that salsa. It's what makes salsa salsa. Um, and so that's why it is safe to be water bath canned. Barbecue sauce, very similar. Barbecue sauce, what makes it tangy is generally going to be vinegar, uh, white distilled vinegar or apple cider vinegar. So again, we are not depending on the tomato to be our acidifier, we're adding additional acidifiers to it. So again, this can be water bath canned. Why cannot, why can't this meat-free spaghetti sauce be water bath canned? And that's because um, for this particular recipe, I added a lot of low acid vegetables, uh, mostly peppers, onions, and garlic, which is very similar to the salsa recipe, but this doesn't have a lot of lime juice or lemon juice or vinegar or apple cider vinegar. It doesn't have an added acidifier in it. So I've added all of these low acid vegetables and I'm not adding anything really high in acid. Remember, I can't depend on the tomatoes to do that for me. So this recipe, in order to be canned safely and on my shelf for years to come, needed to be pressure canned. So if you are brand new to canning, you may have heard from a family member or just online that a tomato, if it's a tomato product, it can be water bath canned, but that's no longer gonna be the case. We really need to be careful with how we uh, make those judgments. If you are brand new to canning, we highly recommend sticking to tested uh, canning recipes. That way you don't have to make that judgment call. That, um, that guesswork is taken away and you know that if you follow that particular recipe, it is going to be safe for water bath canning or it is going to be safe for pressure canning. You don't have to wonder if you're doing it right. That is the value of following tested, proven, safe recipes, removing that guesswork. 
Um, but as you, I know that we have all sorts of people who watch this channel. There are some brand new to food preservation and there are some seasoned canners who have been canning longer than I have been alive. Um, so you know that there are, as we get more experienced, we have a little bit more liberty um, to tweak recipes based on what our knowledge is of safe canning practices. But if you're just starting out, I do highly recommend sticking to tested recipes because then it's out of your hands. It is safe. You don't have to worry about it. Don't have to worry about messing up, doing the right thing, tweaking it safely. You just, you know, peace of mind. It's peace of mind is basically what it is. Okay, so I hope that was helpful to somebody. Number three is going to be the number three mistake is automatically simmering or boiling your canning lids. So again, in years past, we were told that in order to get a good seal on our canning jars, we needed to simmer our canning lids. At once upon a time, it was boiling our canning lids so that they would be sterile, but then it dropped down to simmering our canning lids. But now, depending on what brand you buy, you don't even wanna simmer them in warm water anymore or hot water anymore. So let's talk about those brands. Uh, Ball and Kerr are owned by the same company. And if you look at the packaging side by side, they're almost identical and it, is, it becomes apparent that they are owned by the same company. The brand, the parent company is Newell or Newell, I'm not sure how they pronounce it, um, but they bought out Ball and then bought out Kerr. So now these are the same company. A couple of years ago, Ball came out and said, do not simmer our lids anymore. And what the, the whole reason that is, is because they changed the formula of the rubber ring and I'm not sure how they changed it, I'm not sure what they did to it, but something about the formula changed inside the rubber part on this ring now makes it to where simmering your lids can actually lead to a faulty seal. It can actually not, not loosen this and make it more sticky, but actually deteriorate the rubber on this lid. So if you have been having mysterious lid failures and you don't know what's going on see if you're using ball or cur lids and if you're simmering them go ahead and stop simmering them you can just take them right out of the box put them on your on your jars and or if you want to go ahead and wash them in soapy water that's fine too but just don't simmer them on your stovetop in really hot simmering water um, the way that I found out about this, by the way, you can you can find this information online and verify it. I know, you know, I don't believe anything at the first time that I hear it online, and I don't expect you to, to listen to me and just automatically believe it. So go, you can check out their website, and you can find where they say not to simmer their lids anymore, but I'll tell you how I found that out, and that was because my, la my local um, tractor supply, of all places, they had, um, it was... I think it was 2021, they had a sign posted in their canning aisle that was, I don't remember it word for word, but it was basically saying, hey, don't, don't, don't come complain to us or blame us for faulty lids with, if you're dealing with um, seal failures because it is, Ball has come out and said, and they posted like a screenshot of the Ball's website where it said, do not simmer your lids anymore um, because they were having so many customers come in and complain to them saying that their lids that they were selling at Tractor Supply were faulty because they were having so many lid failures um, or seal failures. So now I know, and I was having the same problem too, but, I, 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 I know I did try the not simmering and I think the uh, seal rates got better when I stopped simmering those lids, but I was still dealing with um, a couple of seal fa failures here and there, like pretty much every canning day that I would do. Um, and that's just, that's just not cool. <laughs> I mean, when we're working so hard to get this food preserved, um, I just had to switch away from ball and cur totally. And I have switched to four jars lids. Um, that I absolutely love four jars lids. And I do want to note that they do recommend still simmering your lids in warm water before putting them on. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, that's just me. Um, I think I've gotten really comfortable with four jars lids and their success rate in sealing that I have just, there have been several times when I haven't even heated them up and I've just put them straight on and they still seal and I still don't have any lid fi uh, seal failures. So. You know, but if you want to go, you know, buy what the manufacturer says, they do say to still simmer your lids. So it does matter 
what brand you're using, but ball and cur, you might not want to not might might not want to be simmering your lids anymore. Okay, number four mistake in food preservation is not blanching your potatoes before preserving them. Um, this is something that I ran into because blanching when you're dehydrating, especially and with freezing, really, uh, blanching is can be optional. Um, it is the best way to preserve nutrients and color um, and when you're dehydrating it's the best way to get the best result when you're rehydrating the dried foods but when you are processing 50 pounds of something and you don't want to go through blanching all that it's totally fine to skip that step for most things not potatoes um, but for most things and just have a little bit of color loss you know um, so i did that I was processing massive amounts of potatoes and did not blanch and they turned gray and some of them black, like a really gross putrid gray black, totally unappetizing. I did not, nobody wanted to eat them, even though they weren't, they weren't bad. It's not a matter of making you sick when you eat them. It's just who wants to eat something gray and black that's not supposed to be gray and black. It's supposed to be nice and vibrant like this. Um, so the only form of food preservation where you don't have to blanch potatoes first is canning. You do not need to blanch potatoes first when you're canning them, but if you're going to be dehydrating, freeze drying, or freezing, you are going to want to blanch those potatoes first because they will turn grayish and blackish on you very, very quickly. So, blanch potatoes, lesson of the day. <laughs> okay, number five, mistake in food storage and preservation is storing glass mason jars or any clear container somewhere where light or it's getting light exposure whether it is sunlight or whether it's just overhead light in your kitchen or your pantry um, light can degrade food quicker or qu as quick if not quicker than oxygen can um, i had super cute decorative shelves in my kitchen and I still do but now I don't store dehydrated foods there but I did. I originally put up these decorative shelves in my kitchen right near my big bay window and that's where I would store. I would have a whole shelf of peas, a whole shelf of corn, a whole shelf of carrots, dehydrated by the way, and I knew the light thing. I mean, I think it's pretty common knowledge that light degrades food and when we are working with food storage and preserved foods, we don't we want to store them in a cool, dry, dark place. Like that's the rule of thumb, cool, dry, dark. And I I knew that. But these were foods that I was going to be cycling through within probably 3 months tops, and so I thought it doesn't matter. This is short term. This is not long term. I'm not going to worry about it. Let me tell you that sunlight bleached my carrots and peas like crazy just within three months. They were night and day color difference between a jar of canned or a jar of dehydrated carrots that had been stored in my back pantry, which is actually in my laundry room, which doesn't have any windows in it. And the, the only time the lights turned on is when I'm throwing clothes in the washer and dryer, light goes right back off. Um, it was a night and day difference between the color just within three months. So even short term, it's really not a good idea to have your clear mason jars or your clear pantry food storage containers in a place where it's getting light. Um, if you are, I'm, I, I deal with space constraints in my home and we do the best that we can, but sometimes perfect is not achievable. So we just need to do the best that we can. And I can tell you that one of the ways I have worked around that is hanging up curtains in front of my shelves. So let's say I don't have room for any more cabinets. I don't have a room where I can store things and keep the light off. If they have to go on a shelf in a room that is getting either sunlight or regular light, you can throw up a curtain over that shelf and just having that, I do recommend it being, um, you know, those blackout curtains that you can get. I do recommend using those. Um, and that is gonna be enough to keep your food from getting bleached by the sunlight. Um, the other thing, of course, is just putting it behind closed doors like you would in a pantry or a cabinet, but I know we run out of space quickly when we are doing this food storage and food preservation life. Um, so curtains have really come in handy for me in trying to prevent that because I do prefer clear storage containers. And we talk about this in our book, Food Prep Guide, about why that is so important to be able to visually watch your inventory dwindle so that you can know when to restock and when to do inventory checks. Um, and it's just also insight in mind 
versus out of sight, out of mind, and it will help you to use those foods. So I do use almost exclusively, except for five gallon buckets, I do use clear containers almost exclusively, but I now know that even if it is just short term, even if it's only gonna be a couple months, it's got to be behind closed doors, in a dark room with no windows, or behind blackout curtains. Okay, y'all, I hope that was helpful to you. I think that's about it. And we will see you on the next video. Bye.